was a very violent entry to the minds of people in the world. But what is important to us, that it was an entry. Dedicated terrorists know that one of the most vulnerable points in the modern world is a jetliner. These powerful symbols of man's technological skill have proved pathetically defenseless. Governments are spending vast sums of money to protect us against political fanatics, but they're aware that a successful defense against terrorism also depends upon their understanding of the mind of the terrorist. So in tonight's film, we try and find out why and how some of them operate and what governments are doing in response. We look at the Palestinian guerrillas who've been responsible for some of the most outrageous acts of air piracy. Skyjacker called Gooey broke into the cockpit and he had his uh, arm around uh, a stewardess Augusta Snyder's neck with a hand grenade and a pen pull and the other one he had a, a pistol at her head. I want to give you a message in case this aircraft lands at Beirut airport. If any attempt is made by any person, policeman or military to approach the aircraft, we will blast it. We have sufficient quantity of dynamite to totally destroy the aircraft. Beirut airport find they're talking to a member of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Within a few hours, a handful of men and women of this small revolutionary group seize four planes, and for the next three weeks, the peace of the world is at stake. According to plan, they divert two planes to Jordan, but not according to plan, two more hijackers miss their intended flight and skyjack instead Captain Priddy's giant jumbo, twice the weight of a 707. Is the fuel sufficient to reach the destined place? Yes, it is, but landing is impossible. We can reach the destined place, but landing there is impossible. What I want you to understand is that this is a 747 aircraft, and it weighs many times the weight of a 707 aircraft. It is impossible to land at the destined place under any circumstance whatsoever. And if it lands there, it'll be a wreck. By nine that night, the jumbo is over Beirut, where the authorities are unwilling to let it land. Okay, this is the captain speaking. Now, how about clearing that runway so that we can get down, huh? Try to impress on these people down there that these guys are serious. They got guns, they got grenades, and the whole works. Now they say if there is any trickery or anything, they are going to blow up the airplane. I wasn't going to argue with him. He also kept that pen pulled on a grenade and kept the ring around his forehand and he, or forefinger, and he would sit there and just twirl it around. Take the following instructions. You first refuel. After you refuel, the same men who are commanding the aircraft now will continue on it to Cairo. Sandwiches will be sent to you so that the comrades may have dinner. The quantity of the sandwiches which we will give to you will be sufficient. Arrange them properly in order for your plan to be a complete success. Successful or not, the Lebanese want no part in this affair, and they only allow the plane to land and refuel at Beirut after two hours of argument. Here, another guerrilla joins the hijackers. Had a net gain of one man, and he was their demolition expert. He's a young fellow, I guess he probably wasn't over 18, 19 years old. And uh, he had this satchel, which uh, we later found out contained the dynamite. Packed with explosives, the jumbo takes off again for Cairo. The guerrillas set the fuse while the plane is in the air. A few minutes after landing, the plane explodes. 172 passengers, crew, and hijackers having scrambled to safety. The whole crew cried. It was a very sad moment. It was a good airplane. It seemed such an utter waste. $25 million for what? 
Pan Am hijackers had planned to travel on an El Al flight. They looked suspicious and were refused seats, but their fellow hijackers, Patrick Arguillo and Leila Khaled, managed to get on the plane. I was on the window seat, and the woman sat next to me, the man sat on the aisle seat. Then suddenly, we were in the air, sailing smoothly. I was reading, and they were very quiet. They didn't say a word to anyone, neither to themselves, to one another, nor to me. And then suddenly, he rose, and he let out a bellow, an animal-like bellow, and he had this little tiny pistol in his hand. And she ran after him, and the two of them were behind the curtains into first class, and then we heard some shots. It sounded like cap pistol shots, but apparently it was more than that. I truly believed that I had to do it, even if I had to lose my life for it, or to be imprisoned, or whatever it is, because there is no uh, big difference between my life without dignity and without my humanity without my people's humanity and dignity, and uh, death. Because death, while struggling, is a step to for my people. On arrival in London, Leila Khaled is taken to a police station, her companion having been mortally wounded in the aerial gun battle. In a far more uncomfortable prison, 316 people are held captive on an airstrip in Jordan, known as Dawson's Field. We've just driven for an hour across the open desert to this incredibly dangerous and dramatic situation in which the people in these two aircraft find themselves. The aircraft marooned here in the middle of the sun-baked salt flats. There are more than 150 commandos dug in around these two aircraft at this particular moment. It's an incredible situation. The uh, people are being held here as hostage. The commandos have told the army that if they don't move back, that if they don't leave them alone, they'll blow up the two aircraft immediately. Governments whose citizens are in danger feel they have no alternative but to negotiate with the terrorists. They choose as their representative Andre Rocha of the Red Cross. But he's not acceptable to the guerrillas. And the man who finds himself bargaining with a popular front is Michael Adams, a journalist once based in the Middle East, now editor of the Middle East International in London. In a situation like this, where you had a guerrilla organization uh, on the one side, and embassies and foreign governments on the other side, it was pretty hard to see what channel of communication there could be between them. They obviously weren't people who would normally talk to each other. So I thought if there could be some middleman who was to some extent on terms with both sides, that could help. How were you being kept informed what the thinking of the British government was and the other Western nations? I simply went uh, from one side to the other. I would go down and see the guerrillas and I would go up and see the British ambassador and tell him anything I'd been able to learn. I was merely a sort of go-between. But you were the only one that the guerrillas would talk to? In effect, I suppose, yes. Actually, we have uh, trusted uh, Michael Adams more than the International Red Cross. Why? Because we know that the International Red Cross at that time was subject to the United States pressure and as a body uh, which receive uh, money from uh, the rich countries, uh, we have expected that uh, pressure would be exerted on them. And actually, this is what happened. But Michael Adams had no official position. He wasn't a diplomat. He wasn't officially representing his government or any government. That's why we trusted him. Bassam was one of the brains behind the multiple hijackings. He was mutilated and partly blinded by a book bomb two years later. In 1970, he and his guerrillas were threatening to blow up the planes and the hostages unless certain Palestinian terrorists were released from Israeli and European jails. And I remember the impression I got then, which I retained through much of this crisis, was one of, of astonishment, really, that the people concerned in it seemed to take it so calmly. They, they seemed not to realize the dimensions of the crisis they'd started. Anyhow, we talked to this uh, Bassam, and while we were actually talking to him, the phone rang, the phone was standing on his desk, the phone rang, and he answered it, and there was a rapid, short conversation in Arabic, and he looked up uh, with a sort of uh, half smile at us, these two Englishmen, and when he put the phone down, he said, well, I'm afraid another plane's been hijacked, and this made the fifth to strengthen their bargaining power with the British government to secure the release of Leila Khalid, 
the Popular Front sees a British plane with 104 passengers, 21 of them children, most returning to boarding schools in England. Can you give us your name first? Nigel. I'm British and I come from Bahrain. The PFLP is completely responsible for the hostages. We will treat them in the same way their governments treat our own prisoners. The PFLP warns that any stupid intervention to free the hostages will only endanger their lives. Some of the hostages, mainly non-Jewish women and children, are moved to Amman, but hundreds still remain imprisoned in the plains. One of them is an American woman in her 60s, Sylvia Jacobson. The most difficult thing on the plane was to watch the steady deterioration, the increasing lack of water, the uncertainty of food, the increasing pallor and drawn looks of everybody, the terrible, terrible smell coming from the toilets, the increasing diarrhea, the sobbing, the crying, the feeling of anxiousness, the knowledge that the plane was wired for explosion, the dust over everything, and the sinking into despair of some of the older people this kind of, of attack on civilian passengers is not war. It's just an act of, of uh, animal violence. Among the problems facing the Swiss, American, German, Israeli and British governments is making sense of the changing demands of the guerrillas. There was never anything in writing except on one single occasion. And then I got the, uh, the Popular Front to agree to a kind of a bargain which I was authorized to put to the British government. And the, the bargain said that in response to my appeals, the Popular Front had decided to proceed with the release of the hostages. Uh, and they understood that in return, I would use my influence to obtain the release of Leila Khalid. Six days after they were first captured, the remaining hostages are released, including all but eight of the British. Those eight, together with another 46 hostages, mainly Jews, crew members and government officials, disappear with the guerrillas. In the end, the Popular Front did agree to uh, release uh, all but this small hardcore of hostages and said they would not blow up the planes. In fact, they, did, they broke the agreement, they blew up the planes. Ten and a quarter million pounds worth of machinery goes up in smoke. The Intercontinental Hotel in Amman becomes a temporary refuge for the released hostages. Families are reunited. Wives greet husbands who for days they feared would be killed. Can you take a minute to tell us how was it out there? Well, it was rough. It was rough. That's about all I can say. Right now I'm a little too shaky to say anything else. For those huddled in the basement of the hotel, conditions are bad enough. But the ordeal of the 54 hostages outside, hidden in refugee camps, is horrific. They're caught up in the crossfire of the civil war, which erupted when King Hussein cracked down on the guerrillas. For some, it's 24 days after they were first skyjacked, before they're rescued by Hussein's troops or released by the guerrillas. I think all the Zionist efforts to mobilize the world public opinion against us failed, especially after the release of the people who were at the uh, revolution airport and who had made the best propaganda for the Palestinian revolution. And I take as an example the uh, on-the-air interview which was made with uh, a rabbi in New York when he said that these people are fighting for a just cause. And if I were one of them, I would do the same. I think that was the best uh, propaganda for the Palestinian revolution. In a world used to atrocities, using the lives of 769 men, women and children as expendable tokens was to many a gross and new kind of horror, not a propaganda victory. But the guerrillas were victorious in blackmailing some of the world's most powerful nations. Only Israel refused to release a single prisoner. The guerrillas' final count was seven Palestinians, including Leila Khaled, freed from European jails. 
what would have happened to the hostages um, on the British plane if the British government hadn't released Leila Khaled? Leila Khaled was released. Yes, but what would have happened if she hadn't been? I said Leila Khaled was released. Yes, but that isn't answering my question. I know. I know definitely that doesn't answer your question. One can be as critical as one likes and say violence is never justified and so on. But if we put ourselves in their shoes, in the shoes of the Palestinians, who lost their homes in 1948, and literally for a quarter of a century had seen the United Nations passing resolutions and people saying something ought to be done for the Palestinians, but seeing nothing done, then I think it's difficult to see how one would uh, resist the temptation in the end to resort to some tougher measures. Any Englishman, I believe, is very much involved in this because it was the decision of a British government which started the whole Palestine problem. Lord Balfour is to the Palestinian terrorists the original arch-villain. His declaration is to the Jews the freehold of their nation. But to the Palestinian Arabs, it's the root cause of their being stateless today. Then as now, they resisted Jewish nationalism fiercely and fought it with terrorism. But despite Arab opposition, thousands of Jews flocked to their promised land. By the 30s, the stream of Jewish immigrants had become a flood tide, as Palestine became the only refuge to 10 million European Jews fleeing from Hitler's death camps. The Jews eventually responded to Arab terrorism and British indecision by forming first their own resistance movement and later their own terrorist groups, the Ergun and Stern Gang. By 1947, we'd had enough and decided to leave the fate of Palestine to the United Nations. A year later, Britain withdrew after the UN decision to partition Palestine. A few hours before we left, the Jews declared the state of Israel. The day after war began, the five surrounding Arab nations launched a concerted attack to destroy the new state. Israel survived. By the end of the war, Palestine had been carved up between Israel and Jordan. The Palestinians had become a refugee nation. 700,000 were displaced, most into camps in Jordan. We found ourselves without land, without dignity, without anything. Everything was taken by others. It was taken by the Israelis, so you can't have. If I ask for a dress, or a toy to play with, or a book to read in the school, it was very difficult for my parents to afford it for us. And uh, the answer always that we are not in Palestine gave me the first motive to say why. Why in tents, why in camps? It's fruitless to argue whether the Palestinians fled in panic or whether they were driven out. Today, 15% of them, that's about half a million people, still live in camps in Jordan, Lebanon and Syria. The Arab states haven't tried to integrate them, perhaps because their wretched state provides the Arab world with its most powerful argument against Israel. The burden of supplying their needs rests with the United Nations. Most choose to live in huts that can be easily dismantled, rather than in concrete houses, because they believe one day they'll return to their homeland, now a Jewish homeland. We are against the Zionists and not against the Jews. But those who came from outside, the Zionists who uh, immigrated since 1948, they are coming just to uh, take place of our people. In a way, uh, there could have been here a Palestine, an Arab state, had there not been Israel. I wouldn't say at expand, but I would have said as a replacement, because what happened here was that we came here, and had the Arab accepted living together, things would have been differently. Now, they started a war once the decision about a Jewish state was taken against us during the war they fled, about six or seven hundred thousand of them, and right after that, about eight hundred thousand Jews came from Arab countries, from Morocco and from Iraq and Yemen and Syria and so on. 
So what happened was at that time a transfer. And I think that the only way to solve it is not by the Palestinian coming back from Lebanon over here, but settling down permanently forever there, just like the Jews that had to leave Iraq are now Israeli citizens. Viennese-born Frederick Hacker is an American professor of psychiatry at law. His advice on how to deal with political kidnappers has been sought by the governments of the United States and Austria. He's made a special study of the mind of the terrorist. If you, uh, you uh, take a million people, let's say, uh, settle them uh, around a country where you say to them every day of their lives that this has been taken away from them by force and illegitimately, and they could get it back only if they, uh, they uh, act in a certain courageous way. If furthermore, they live under bad conditions so that they have nothing to lose and nothing much to give up. The result is predictable. Namely, 90% of them will become apathetic and resign and incapable of moving. But about 10% of them will become uh, extremely activistic, uh, ready to sacrifice themselves and everything for their cause. And these 10% will consist, unfortunately, for us, of the worst ones and of the best ones. In other words, there will be some of them that will be real leader personalities. The guerrillas' early hit-and-run operations, like setting fire to kibbutzim, were no real military threat to Israel. It was the armies of the Arab nations who for 19 years fought the Palestinians' war for them and fought it unsuccessfully. The shock of Israel's total victory in the war of June 67 destroyed the Palestinians' belief that the Arab states would get them back their homeland. The war also left thousands of Palestinians on the West Bank under Israeli rule and created hundreds of thousands of new refugees, some for the second time. It was after this humiliating defeat that the guerrillas or Fedayeen began to organize seriously. <laughs> It was an Israeli attack on the Jordanian town of Karami that boosted the popularity of the Fedayeen. Here, a strong Israeli force met with tough resistance, both from the guerrillas and Hussein's troops. The Fedayeen claimed it as a victory. Palestinian children are still fed the myth of Karami. Their heroes are those who are willing to die for the homeland. The Palestinians, interestingly enough, quite consciously copy some of the methods and the thinking of what they believe 50 years ago or 70 years ago the Zionists did. They feel that the Zionists would never have accomplished in founding a, an Israeli state if they had not uh, held on to an idea that was considered particularly by their own compatriots, as, as a crazy idea, as an impossible, as a dream impossible to accomplish if they had not used all kinds of methods, and particularly also terroristic methods, in order to accomplish that, and if they had not single-mindedly and with almost monomanic preoccupation with one and the same idea uh, fought for that idea, and in a sense they tried to imitate now what they think the Zionist example has been. There are deep divisions in the guerrilla movement, particularly between the politics of al-Fatah and the Marxist popular front. But what unites them all is their determination to settle for nothing less than the whole of the land that is now the Jewish state of Israel. We do not want Jews to leave Palestine. We are ready to live there together, equally, with equal civil rights. But we are against Zionism, which is the political structure in Israel. The only solution that would lead to a true peace is the establishment of a democratic society on the whole of Palestine. I've, I, I speak Arabic, and in a way, and I really, I, I like the Arabs, I like them, and feel close to them. And I think that we can live together with them, and we have been living together with them now for a few years. So. But I'm a Jew and a very Jewish. Only Jews are Jews, Jewish and their own nationality, what Arafat called race. We haven't been assimilated. 
So these are my people, and I feel close to them and want them to come here and want to maintain relations with them much more than with my neighbor, who is an Arab, whom I'm ready to live with, but as a neighbor, not as a, my, my own people. What, what, what are the Palestinians? I'm not trying to say that they don't feel that Jaffa is their home because for generations they were there. They do feel. But if anybody is trying to tell me that they can assimilate with us and they cannot assimilate with the Arabs 20 kilometers across the border, in, in, in Beirut or in Amman or in Damascus, this is sheer nonsense. Many other Arab countries have made it clear that they don't want to accept them. And an educated Palestinian said to me in Beirut, we are the Jews of the Middle East. Yes, well, all Arab countries support their wish and a political objective to go back to Israel. All Arab countries do not want Israel to exist. If you really listen how they feel about it, not what they say from time to time politically, they would rather not have a Jewish state here. And they do believe that eventually, with so many herbs and so much pressure, our fate will be like the, the one of the Crusaders in the uh, 12th or 13th century, that the, the herbs will drive us back out. The largest of the groups, with about 10,000 members, is Al Fatah. It's led by Yasser Arafat, who's also chairman of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which embraces most of the guerrilla forces. From this barrel, from this, uh, from this, uh, th through this barrel, we can get all our, what we want, our homes, our land. What we have is a Jewish state, a Jewish state. It so happened that Jews are Jewish too, not a... Uh, Muslims and uh, Jews are Jews and not Arabs. Now, we are about three millions here. And what Arafat said, and I'm quoting his figures in uh, the UN, that with all the Arabs that would come here, there will be uh, almost four million or 10.8 or something. That is to say that what he suggests that we will have here a majority of Arabs here because all of the Muslims will come back here with it. And that will be the end of a Jewish state. Thank you. The Ashbel, or Lion Cubs, are indoctrinated to believe that they must be prepared to kill in order to destroy the Jewish state. A ten-year-old boy inherits the gun of a dead Fedayeen. He may never be a soldier in a regular army, but could well become a terrorist and perhaps be involved in operations far removed from border shooting raids. Perhaps the most shocking of the acts committed in the name of Palestine was the indiscriminate killing of 26 people, mainly Puerto Rican pilgrims, and the wounding of 80 others at Lod Airport at Tel Aviv. The three Japanese gunmen were recruited and trained by the Popular Front. It was after this that Bassam received his book bomb. Did you realize when you authorized the uh, Lod Airport operation that tourists were going to be killed, ordinary people visiting to them the Holy Land? Well, Palestine is our country, and Palestine is a battlefield. We have warned seven times, and I can give you the dates. We have warned every person in the world not to visit Palestine because Palestine is not a tourist attraction. It's a battlefield and it is our land. Anybody who gets killed or injured in Palestine would be carrying his own responsibility because we have warned him not to use any of the Israeli institutions, whether planes, ships, etc., or to use any of the facilities like airports, harbors in Palestine. At Lod, we consider that Lod Airport is part of this bat battlefield. And uh, I think this line will continue. People might look to an operation carried at Lod Airport as a brutal act or as a barbarous attack, while 
killing hundreds of children by American phantoms in our refugee camps is considered an act of war. We haven't bombed refugee camps as such. 